Welcome to our live event with Dutch political scientist, Cass Müller. Before introducing Cass Müller, we very warmly thank Vox Europe subscribers and shareholders for their support. It enables us to keep hosting such events, keep translating and publishing quality journalism throughout investigations, great cartoons, and last but not least, stay independent. Yes, thank you, Catherine. And this is a special week for us at, as Vox Europe celebrates its 10th birthday, 10 years of independent journalism, again made possible by our subscribers and shareholders. And to mark the occasion, a few days ago, we launched a major subscription campaign, which will run until the European elections. You'll find the link to our new subscription offers in the chat room. We are also offering new subscribers benefits, such as the chance to vote for investigative stories, a behind the scene newsletter, live events, and more. Our campaign will come to an end after the European elections, so don't hesitate to join and spread the word. Note that this event is being recorded. The recording will be available on our website in a few days. You can write your questions in the chat in the language of your choice that we will translate for you. We will activate your microphones about 20 minutes uh, before the end, so you'll be able to have an informal chat with our guest. Now, before we start, we have a tradition at Vox Europe. Please write in the chat box where you're based currently. I am Catherine André, Editorial Director and Co-Founder, and I am based in Paris. Now, with three weeks to go before a crucial election for European democracy, with the far-right parties and formations that are flourishing in a num growing number of member states, and they, take the lion's uh, they are taking the lion's share of votes. Or we think they are going to take the lion's share of votes. We will discuss this in a minute. What will the consequences be for the life of the continent and for the European Union's foreign policy, particularly regarding support for Ukraine? We are very pleased to introduce our guest, Cass Müller. So, Cass, you are a Stanley Wade Shelton University of Georgia professor in the School of Public and International Affairs and also a distinguished research professor at the same University of Georgia. Uh, you're the author, among others, of Populism, a very short introduction in 2017, and also uh, of the far right today in 2019. Uh, you're a columnist for the Swedish daily Aftonbladet and a regular contributor to The Guardian, as well as for Vox Europe, of which you are a much appreciated shareholder. Okay, so now, Cass, we, we start with our first question. Three weeks before the European elections, what are your main observations compared to the vote in, 19, in, 20, in 2019? I think, first of all, what I observe is what I always observe in the run-up to the European election, and that there is by and large no interest. Um, there's no interest of the media. Um, there is virtually no campaign. Um, I think what perhaps is a little bit more interesting is that as far as I see campaign, it, it comes from the far right. Um, I think probably Orban was the first to start the European campaign. Um, Rassemblement National has been very active. Um, <clears throat> whereas, I mean, basically looking at the news from the, the few countries I follow, um, there, there virtually is, is no campaign. Uh, if I look at the Netherlands, my own country, um, I, I just saw a picture of, um, of the different posters and they were beyond uninspiring, except that <clears throat> one of the interesting things, which is partly Dutch, but I think a bit broader, was far more Euroscepticism um, on the posters. There were more parties that were Eurosceptic, not Euro reject, they're not against the EU, um, but they think it's gone too far. Um, and, and I think that's a sentiment that is now again stronger than 2019. Um, the other thing is of the different groups, it's very clear that the EPP is setting the agenda as far as there is an agenda. Uh, it's not uncommon because it's the biggest group. Of course, this time 
the EPP kind of has two campaigns. The one that started was a bit more ideological, where they tried to literally set the agenda, which topics to talk about, which was mostly immigration and the European Green Deal. And then later they added defense slash Ukraine to it. Um, after that, the whole von der Leyen saga kind of messed up that. And, and then almost everything became about the re-election of, of von der Leyen, and whatever that means. And so I see overall just the same as we always see, despite the fact that we are now in a context in which, particularly for those who are in favor of European integration, you would, you would imagine that there is a lot to sell. Um, the EU is clearly needed in terms of Ukraine. Um, there is a broad support for that, although it is, of course, declining over time. Um, we, are, we, we have an increasingly aggressive Russia and China <clears throat> and a potentially isolationist US. And so like this is the perfect time to actually have a fundamental debate about where the EU should go, and in particular, I think, two issues, which, to their credit, the EPP has put on the agenda. One, Ukraine. <clears throat> and with Ukraine, kind of, how far does the EU go? Um, and so that's Ukraine membership support. And the other, which is at least as fundamental, is defense. And, and in what way is Europe going to defend itself? Is that going to be through NATO, is they going to be through the EU, is they going to be through a new organization, um, that should have been, those should have been some of the key topics, and they're not. Okay. Thank you, Cass. In a series of articles on the election campaign in uh, the 27 EU member states that we've published in partnership with uh, 27 news outlets from as many countries, there's a kind of pattern uh, according to which the far right is expected to make great wins. And many centrist or moderate parties seem to have absorbed uh, the far right narrative. Uh, do you agree with this, uh, this pattern? And if so, why is it this way? What happened? Yeah, I, on the one hand, I do agree with it. On the other hand, it's also the, the over arching narrative of the European election. Um, like the media always needs one simple narrative. And with regard to the far right or populism, they're either dying or they're winning. There's nothing in between. Like, and so they're either taking over or they're dead. So with COVID, they were dead and then miraculously came back. And then you had the Polish election and they were like, they were dead again. And we learned the lesson of how to defeat them. And then the Dutch elections came and the Dutch elections very clearly have set the, 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 the narrative, the frame for the European election. And that was the same frame as 2019 and to a large extent, the same frame of the 2014, which sees a weak and embattled kind of center, political mainstream, being challenged by a more popular, emboldened far right. Um, I think that I mean, there clearly is is, is um, <clears throat> evidence for that. Um, in many countries, the far right's doing well. In about seven countries, they're of, of the twenty seven, they're the biggest party, um, which is unique. <clears throat> um, at the same time, there is no trend. There, there's no kind of break with a trend. Like, I don't expect a massive win because the far right won in 2014 and 2019 already. And so they're just, they're going up relatively gradually. And importantly, in some countries, they will go down and in others, they will go up a lot. Um, now, with regard to adopting the agenda of the far right, I would say if I compare it to the period in, in the wake of particularly the so-called immigration crisis of 2015-16, it is not as dominant. So in that period, almost all parties, 
deep into the green parties were very skeptical of, of Merkel's policy, of the open border policy, if you want to call it that. Going into this election, it is very clearly the EPP that has adopted the agenda of mostly the ECR. <clears throat> um, and at a certain, the IND and ECR are not that different, but we'll talk about that later. <clears throat> um, and so as I said, they've picked up. ECR is the conservatives and ID is the far right. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, this is this is exactly where we go wrong. I mean, the the ECR is the European Conservatives and Reformists, which is the group that was to, which was founded by the Conservative Party under David Cameron, <clears throat> and which was indeed predominantly conservative in the first two periods. In this outgoing Parliament, um, that group is led by law and justice in Poland and Brothers of Italy, which are both very clearly far-right parties. And actually, if you look at the ECR membership, there are only a minority of parties that are truly can truly be called conservative. To, to be honest, I think ODS in, in the Czech Republic probably being the only traditional conservative party, because NVA in Belgium, for example, has also adopted most of the agenda of the far right. <clears throat> so there's a difference between, let's say, the transformed conservative radical right and the original radical right, which is the IND of Lega in Italy and, and Rassemblement National. Um, as said, there is this weird part which has to do with, with the, I would say, the origins as well as the normalization of the far right, where in Brussels they claim there is a cordon sanitaire around the far right, which means that they do not collaborate with the far right. But that's only true for IND, so for the traditional far right parties of Marine Le Pen and Matteo Salvini, to keep it simple. There is not such a cordon around the ECR, including very clearly around Giorgia Meloni, who in no way, shape or form can be seen as a conservative rather than a far-right politician. <clears throat> and so EPP has adopted largely the ECR agenda, being very critical about immigration, being very critical about the European Green Deal, but claiming that they have solved these issues, whereas the far right only shouts from afar. And so they're, they're trying to combine kind of on the one hand their agenda, but then win on the basis of competence, hoping that people will think with all these deals with authoritarian regimes in the MENA region, like Tunisia and now Egypt and before Turkey, that that the, that the mainstream right has taken care of immigration and so the far right is no longer needed. Okay, thank you, Gus. You're bringing a lot of uh, nuances, um, but I still like to ask the question, do you think generally speaking, or also according to various national polls, that broadly speaking, European Europeans are begin beginning to be more, or are turning more reactionary than before, and if so, why? And if not, how actually? What could one measure this? Yeah, so there's quite a lot of research on this, which shows a kind of a paradoxical situation. So there's no doubt that Europeans are voting for more reactionary parties, or let me rephrase that: more Europeans vote for reactionary parties. Although it's kind of both, there are also more reactionary parties now because the right, the mainstream right, has radicalized and have become more right wing. At the same time, all almost all public opinion surveys show that people have not become more right wing. In fact, if there's any type of trend, it is a very slow trend towards a little bit more whatever, liberal cosmopolitan position, which is mostly a consequence of generational change. Right? So younger generations are more inclusive with regard to gender, sexuality, ethnicity. They tend to be also more pro-European integration, whereas older people tend to be more reactionary. 
old people die, more young people come. And so we get slowly, not in large groups. So at, at best, what we see is that people are the same, but politics becomes more reactionary. Now, the question is, why is that? I think there, there are two answers to that, but they both have to do with the supply. And so to a certain extent, for a very long time, more reactionary voters had very few options to vote. The only parties they could vote for that had their agenda of Euroscepticism, immigration skepticism, whatever, were parties of the far right, which were generally seen as unacceptable. Today, as said, because of the radicalization of mainstream parties, but also because of many new parties that have emerged that very often are more right-wing parties, there are many more parties, including parties that are completely acceptable, that are reactionary and can vote for. So if I take an, a, an Italian example, like if you were far right before or just reactionary, like, then you pretty much in the 90s had virtually nothing. Even Lega was actually pro-EU, but Lega was on top of that a northern party. Right? And, and so it was kind of unacceptable to quite a lot of people in the middle and the south. Um, so you had the, the, the really small fascist parties. Today you have the prime minister. Right? And so while that party is far right, that party is treated as if it's a mainstream party. So you can just go around in Italy in whatever circle and say that you vote Meloni and it will not have the same type of social costs as you had before. So it, it has a lot to do with what is on offer. Um, and so to a certain extent, um, there was always, we, we knew from polls that there were far more people reactionary than there were reactionary voters. Actually, a large portion of people with more reactionary views voted for mainstream right-wing parties, which, ve which was very clearly different from the far right. <clears throat> Today, these parties are not very different from the far right. And that has a lot to do with the second part, which is there is a kind of a normalization and mainstreaming of far right ideas, as well as of far right parties in most countries. And what we see is that both journalists and politicians um, think or seem to think, because we don't have data on, on all countries, that people are actually much more right-wing than they really are. And so journalists and politicians, and, and there's a very general category, which are both, of course, very heterogeneous, but on, on average, believe that the people, which is a highly problematic concept, are primarily uh, busy with immigration and they're skeptical about it. They're worried about all kinds of things, but not housing not healthcare, it's always kind of social cultural things. And, and so there is this narrative, which in the Netherlands is called the Besorgde Burger or the concerned citizen. And the concerned citizen across Europe is kind of a reactionary citizen. It's someone who is worried about crime, it's worried about the European Union and corruption and immigration, etc. And more and more politicians cater to them because they believe that that is the bulk of the voter. Yes, it is in this kind of shift uh, to the right or to uh, the mainstreamization of radical conservatism, um, is it a, a, an effect or is there an influence of these information campaigns uh, which uh, originate most of them from Russia and are at work uh, across Europe, to some extent also from the US, uh, the origin? So I'm, I'm not a disinformation scholar, but I'm a disinformation skeptic. And so most of the research that I know shows that there are relatively small effects of disinformation. And the reason is very simple. The people, the, the vast majority of people who consume disinformation 
are people who already are very skeptical. And so they're looking for that type of information. Now that can mean, for example, that they will get also skeptical about a topic where they weren't skeptical about yet. And I think that you see this the most, <clears throat> mostly anecdotal evidence, but, but some survey evidence of people who were skeptical about COVID and who are now skeptical about Russia. And so that includes, let's say the yoga moms, like the stereotypical group of wellness, higher educated, like middle-class wellness people who are very skeptical of COVID for, for reasons that have nothing to do with geopolitics. But COVID created this kind of anti-state, anti-establishment self-identity and brought them together with certain groups, which then also took up the issue of Russia versus Ukraine. And, and so without, without that link, they might simply not have cared about Russia or Ukraine, right? Whereas now they will think that Ukraine is full of Nazis and, and Russia's on the right side. Does that impact how they vote? I seriously doubt it, right? And, and so you always have to keep an eye out that a lot of these narratives come from the US. And there are two things in the US that are different. First, news consumption. Right? The US doesn't have a dominant public medium. You, you don't have state TV, state radio. Um, and, and news consumption is generally very, very small. <clears throat> the second is that because of the electoral system, very small shifts have massive consequences. Uh, if, you, if you switch 4,000 people in Wisconsin and 5,000 people in Michigan, you win the presidential election. In proportional systems, these type of shifts don't have similar effects, right? It just means that from 12%, you go to 13%. Um, <clears throat> so in, in that sense, like, yes, there is an impact, but the impact is pretty small. And the idea that we have these neutral people who just consume this information and then become believers there's just not much in, much evidence for that. Maybe I can ask the, a question that uh, Natalia, uh, I hope I, I can pronounce your surname properly, Natalia Vesgreen. I'm sure it's wrong, but you will correct us uh, when we open the microphone. Um, mm -hmm. So Natalia writes, um, I was reflecting on how the shocking shooting in Slovakia today, and the attack on the Prime Minister Fico can consolidate right-wing voters, not only in Slovakia, but also in the you know, in the Visegrad region, and potentially fuel the far right across Europe prior to the election. Uh, okay, she would love to hear your initial thoughts on that event. Yeah, I actually hadn't heard about the shooting. Um, after all, I live very far away. Um, but I have a long-standing connection with Slovakia, so I will check it later. Um, by and large, my answer would be very little effect. <clears throat> um, people really, I, I think particularly people who live in an interconnected world, really overestimate how, how international, transnational the life of people is. Elections are about national topics. In fact, Europe often barely plays a role in European elections. Um, <clears throat> again, these are type of things for most voters who care about this. They, they care about this because they already have a predisposition towards something. So, I mean, uh, if this is an attack on Fizzo, then like for Fizzo people, this will strengthen the belief uh, that the other side is evil. But they already have that. Like, otherwise you don't vote for Fizzo. That's his whole spiel. <clears throat> um, and people who are, who are radical on the other side will think that this is probably framed or something like that. Like, most people in the middle will be shocked and will be talking about something else tomorrow. Um, so we, 
people who consume news, let alone people who are very active on social media, have, have a very, very warped view of reality. And reality is that the vast majority of people consume little news and care about very little. Okay, um, maybe we can uh, slowly move to one of the aspects of the debate. What we wanted to discuss with you is the role of the media. Um, you mentioned the United States, maybe that's obvious in the States, uh, but you, you wrote for us a, a piece, so we're going to put the link in the chat, uh, of the role play, played by the media in the normalizing um, that you mentioned before of the far-right narratives. Uh, I'd like to know how did it all start and when? Um, and um, do you think maybe the, the press symbiotic relationship uh, with the far-right uh, is due to a mere economic logic? That's something you mentioned in this article, and uh, we'd like to know more about it. Um, it's difficult to say where it started. I mean, I would argue that if there was a watershed moment, it was probably in the 80s with the privatization of the media. I mean, many people forget or just like are not old enough to remember a period in which most newspapers in, um, in Europe were kind of owned or linked to political parties in one way or another, either through churches or trade unions. And, and so people didn't read like all the newspaper. You read the newspaper that was of your group. So if you were a communist, you read the communist newspaper in Italy, for example. If you were Catholic, you read the Catholic newspaper. And those newspapers were not there to make profit. <laughs> they were there to inform the own group, to inform them and, of course, to keep them within the own group. <laughs> and so... There was, self, there was censorship. Like, if you wanted to know about the corruption scandal of Catholic politicians, you, didn't, you shouldn't read the Catholic newspaper. You have to go to the Social Democratic one. And if you wanted to hear about the decline of the trade union support, <laughs> you shouldn't go to the Social Democratic one, right? You went to, to the Catholic or the liberal one. The privatization of the media has changed the logic. Because now there wasn't some organization that kind of took care of the basic cost. And so a, a kind of a neoliberal logic was now in it. And that, of course, um, is what in, in the U.S. you call it chasing eyeballs. And so media were starting to trying to find readers viewers, listeners, whatever the medium was. And how do you do that with scandals? with something that, that hits, right? And so what hits? The far right. At least in the 80s, 90s, the far right was the, was, was the bad guy. Right? Now, there are different logics in that. I always have felt, but I don't have evidence for it, that left-wing newspapers gave disproportionate attention <clears throat> to the far right. Mm -hmm. And I think for two reasons. One, because they were... I think genuinely more concerned, but also their audience was much more concerned. I mean, liberals love to be afraid of the far right. They will eat it up. Like every story about Bannon directing the European elections in 2019, one of the, the dumbest stories that was out there, like, was eaten up. <clears throat> like they love the, 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 this image of this, of like Trump as the cult leader. And Bannon as the Rasputin, and, and now we do it with Bardella, who is a, allegedly this like wizard of social media. Um, and, and those stories sell. Like, I mean, those get the most views. And, and so, of course, they're published. So we so, give it too much attention. I think, I think, first of all, the far right is getting disproportionate attention, although that is less and less the case because the far right's bigger and bigger. Um, Second of all, they are treated in very inconsistent and incoherent ways. So on the one hand, there is this endless story about the danger. 
which for a very long time was completely inflated. Like in the 1990s, we were more worried about the far right than we are today. Um, because once the far right becomes powerful, they also become dangerous for, for, for journalists, right? It can be sued. <clears throat> um, you can get angry responses from readers who say, oh, but Maloney is not far right. He's conservative. And so what do you see? You see increasingly euphemisms being used. So racism is a term that's completely not used, even though the far right has actually started to talk about whiteness for the first time pretty much in the last decade. Um, so it's now populism. It's kind of a euphemism for far right, or even worse now, national conservative or conservative. Um, and so you see, you see that, and what you see is a normalization so you, you see not just interviews with the far right, which sometimes are aggressively negative, which doesn't ha which helps the far right too, or they're they're just soft type interviews. We had an interview on, the Dutch, on Dutch TV <clears throat> with Geert Wilders uh, about his cat, for example. Um, and so there is this this change from oh the fascists are coming to oh it's just people like us. Um, there's no contextualization. And there's also no, I, there's an idea on the one hand that the far right is different. They are a threat to liberal democracy, but we should still treat them the same. Which there are exceptions as French media, and particularly the Walloon media in Belgium. <clears throat> but in many others, there's this argument from, from journalists who say, oh, but like people have a right to know what they stand for. Of course they do, but you don't have to give them an op-ed to make that clear. First of all, we know that within the far right, <clears throat> politicians treat the truth with even less regard than in other parties. Second of all, this is a party that is against the legal structure of your country as well, and this is what I argue in the piece, the normative foundation and legal foundation of, of which of the independent media. An independent media does not exist within a far right state, as we see in Hungary, as we saw in Poland, and as we are starting to see in Italy. Yeah, to totally agree on, uh, on Italy and on the normalization of the far right narrative. In the in the Italian mainstream media, uh, would you say that the, the success of the far right and its narrative can be credited as, as a full self fulfilling prophecy fueled by the media? I mean, by saying the far right is even more successful, it's going to win, it's going to win. In the end, it uh, it succeeds. No, I think that's that's. That's too easy. And so first of all, let me reiterate, I do think that the medium, and I look at it as an institution, right? and, and a, very, a very heterogeneous institution, but still, this is not about individual journalists. Actually, I know quite a lot of journalists, quite a lot of journalists would like to write different types of stories, or stories about different topics. <clears throat> but if you're in the US, if you're the foreign correspondent in the US, you're going to write about Trump because that's what your readers want to read. And so you, because of the neoliberal logic, anything media do is almost always partly the responsibility of its readers because they follow them, right? And so if the readers don't read all these stories, don't the, fl the fluff interviews with, with far-right politicians, the journalists are not going to write them. The editors are not going to commission them. <clears throat> the second thing is that there's always been a disproportionate attention for the far right. Also at a time that the far right was not strong. In the end, mainstream politicians, particularly of the right, but in many countries broader than that, have helped mainstream and normalize the agenda. And so it, it is a collective effort. Right? And and and. <laughs> Many people are passively or actively uh, complicit in this. Um, 
And so as a consequence, it's, it, it also doesn't have very easy solutions. But can you think of some exceptions in Europe, if in some European countries, for example, where you would, you would say that the press or the medium have uh, acted differently towards the the rise of the this extremism. Yeah, I I can't take an example at the national level, but at the subnational level, that would be Wallonie, the French speaking part of of Belgium. But that comes with a massive number of complexities. Um, I, it, it's almost a an artificial type of situation in which they live. But it, it's clear that in Wallonie, the cordon sanitaire, and, and what, what my, my colleague Leonie de Jong in Groningen has called the cordon mediatique, is, is still there. Right? Mm -hmm. And so Walloon, or traditionally, I don't know whether it still holds, Flemish far-right uh, politicians are not on the TV. That being said, when I lived in Belgium, in the in the two thousand in the early two thousands, um, and before that already, they would spend disproportionate attention on Front National in France. <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken, there were interviews there as well. Um, so there there are differences. I mean, the French media treats the far right different than the Dutch. Like the normalization of the far right is is much higher in Denmark or or in Italy or in the Netherlands than it is in Germany, for example, or, or in France. But even there, there has been a shift. And what you also have is, and that is a really an important new development, is the polarization is different. In the 1980s, 1990s, you had a, a small group of people who supported the far right. Then there was a bit bigger group that supported the far right, but didn't actually act upon it yet because of the social stigma that was on it. And then you had everyone else and they were against the far right. And I hope today that those first two groups are now one. You don't have a group that doesn't vote far right anymore because of social stigma. In almost no country, that stigma is still around. But you also don't have just two groups as those who like the far right and those who oppose it. There is a group in between for whom the far right is an accept acceptable second option. And my example is always the comparison of the 2002 pr French presidential election and the 2017 or 22, if you want. Like, so in 2002, Jean-Marie Le Pen, because of all kinds of weird, <laughs> very idiosyncratic reasons, made it into the second round. In the second round, he got about 18% in the first round and about 19% in the second, right? Showing that there was no space of people who thought Jean-Marie Le Pen was not their first choice, but their second. It was first or not. Marine Le Pen gets actually not that much more in the first round, which is also very telling. But she gets far more in the second round. So what does that tell us? That actually the core support of the far right has not necessarily increased that much in the last two decades. But for there is a larger group now for whom they are a better option. And you see that, for example, in the last Dutch election, where there's a sizable portion that went from the VVD, the traditional conservative party, to Wilders. They are not necessarily really Wilders supporters. They just thought that the VVD needed to go further to the right. And several can return to the VVD again. <clears throat> and so that is what the normalization about the far right is. For a sizable group of the population, the far right is a party like any other. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yeah, just a side note: the um, what you said about Walloon, yeah, uh, will be developed in an article that we will be running in the coming days by uh, Manuel Abramovitz on the far right in uh, in Belgium. So, look forward for reading it. Um, considering the situation that you described, 
are there some avenues for a different, more fitting, maybe more ethical approach? Should journalists uh, in the, or the media cover the far right uh, protagonists in a more critical way since they are more biased than other actors of uh, the society and um, maybe also more hostile to key uh, democratic uh, institutions and uh, minorities? And actually, before you answer, Kas, I ask a last question. So you have the three together and then we can open the mics. Uh, do you think uh, journalists are well informed enough about the far right? So, think no, I mean, uh, journalists are not, nor are politicians, um, nor are actually most people. Uh, but as, of course, a, as an academic who studies this for decades, then it's easy to say. But, um, but I think in one of the ways that we see it is that the stereotype of the far right today is the same stereotype of the 1980s, 1990s, right? And so I have a colleague here in the U.S., Cynthia Miller-Idris, who has also talked, she does a lot about the, the visualization of the far right. And if you look traditionally at the image of the far right, right it's a skinhead, right? It's a working class, younger guy, shaved hat, tattoos, aggressive, right? In, in fact, she even showed that the colors used to, tended to be, particularly in Germany, like red and black, right? And so it's very clearly, it's the extreme right. Today, a lot of pictures still have that, right? When we talk about the symbols of the far right, we often still have the symbols of the past, right? From swastikas to, to Celtic crosses to whatever. And as I tell my students, always, because I ask my students, do you know someone who is far right? And over the, over the years, that has barely changed. Most say no. And the ones that say yes, come up with some vague, like acquaintance that was a skinhead, right? Now, my students come mostly from the better off in Atlanta, of whom at least half vote for Trump. And many of their dads are true Trump supporters, but they will never think that those are far right, right? And so we write about the far right that no longer exists. We write about the far right as if it is still, for the sake of argument, Trump and Salvini, but it's Orban and Meloni. It's professional politicians who have a similar background as most people in media or academia and whatever, um, who work from within the system, who are smart, who are calculated, uh, or just politicians like other politicians. Like, and the people who vote for them are not some, are not the work, the white working class, right? I mean, we recently had a, a study of the electorate of Geert Wilders in the last election. It was pretty much like just a cross cut of Dutch society. Right? And so that is one of the most important things is how media reflects on the far right, how it portrays it. Right? And so the picture, of course, the picture of the skin at cells, that's what we like to see that makes us scared. Seeing your uncle is not very scary and doesn't send the same message. But it is your uncle who votes for the far right, not that skinhead who doesn't vote at all. Right? So in that sense, I think that is crucial. I also think that journalists and politicians know, know far too little about what liberal democracy is, the essence of the system in which they operate and which most profess to support normatively. Right? And so... A liberal democracy is a very complex system that tries to find some type of balance between majority rule and minority rights, to put it very simple. <clears throat> and there is no one perfect combination. It's always a struggle. Um, and so the other thing is that liberal democracy is based on pluralism, the idea that society consists of various groups with different interests and values, which are all legitimate. Yet we talk increasingly about politics in the populist narrative of the people as being homogenous. 
as the establishment as being homogenous, the people as being always kind of righteous, right? If it is about economic anxiety, but they do have a point, like isn't globalization undermining this? I mean, again, yes, there are people who are suffering economic consequences of globalization and vote for the far right. The vast majority are doing fine. I mean, I just tweeted about it today. We have a new study in the Netherlands that shows 85% of Dutch people are happy, are happy with the way life is. 33% of Dutch people support builders at the moment, right? So this idea that you have these, these, these desperate left behinds who are angry, like, yes, they are there, but the vast majority are just people like roughly like you and me, but just with different ideas. So if we don't get that into the way we talk about it, we don't understand where the danger comes from. The danger doesn't come from the street. The danger comes from within the parliament. Um, I kind of forgot Jean Paul's question now. Um, uh, it was, um, what are the venues for a different and more fitting approach? Should, should journeys be more critical in their approach towards far-right politicians? Well, so my position is journalists should, oh, everyone should be critical. Right? I'm Dutch after all. So you should be critical of everything, every authority and those without authority. You should be critical of every politician, right? But you should be more critical of politicians who you know twist the truth more often, whether they're far right or not, but the far right does that more often, and of politicians who are against the legal system in which you operate and, again, which most journalists and their mediums pretend to support. And so if you believe in liberal democracy, then the far right is a threat. That is an objective fact. And I, I, I just don't get there. You just treat them the same as a party that, that doesn't undermine your system. Right? And so for me, there is a fundamental difference between conservatives and the far right. I have massive problems with conservatives <clears throat> over socioeconomic and social cultural issues, but they function within the system. And that is not everything, but it is crucial. And so I think you should be informed and critical. Like all that grandstanding and, and type of gotcha journalism of trying to get like the, the far right person to say something really racist or anti-Semitic, it first of all fully overestimates the cleverness of journalists and fully underestimates how clever these politicians are. They've been doing this for decades, most of them. They know exactly what to say. So what you should do if you interview them, which I'm not the biggest fan of, is you should know what he's going to answer or she is going to answer because they have done it over and over. And you should have a follow-up question, which, which shakes them a little bit, where they actually kind of have to show their face. Um, you should also not always ask them about their issues. Why do we never ask the far right what their position on housing or healthcare or education is, all of which are key issues for voters, right? And so if you ask them once, they will say, oh, education, well, we don't want it to be indoctrination, right? And, but then you talk about the illiteracy rate, which is going up in various countries, right? And they will generally come with, an, of course, a racist answer that this is just only among immigrants. But it's the same with housing. Like we had a housing debate in the Netherlands. If you just ask them, like, what's the problem of housing? They say asylum seekers. But asylum seekers, at least <clears throat> refugees, the ones that have been accepted, take up less than 10% of housing, new housing. Right? And so you should follow up and say, okay, so now we still have 90%. Like, what are you going to do with, with that? To show that they have a very limited agenda. Whereas if you ask them endlessly about the few points on which they have a point, it seems that they are a very coherent party that can take care of everything. I mean, this one 
pivotal moment in the first debate of the first uh, French uh, presidential runoff um, between Macron and Le Pen, where they talked about the euro policy of Le Pen, right? And where she talked about that she wanted to have, on the one hand, a euro for international business, and on the other hand, the franc in in France, right? And that just shows that they have no idea about this. And there's a reason for that. They don't have to, because they never asked about it. Right? And so I think that is, those are things you can do. You don't have to be hostile. Hostility only helps them. Right? If, if, the, if the, the journalist is very hostile, the only thing they have to do is remain calm. And they will come out as better among both their supporters and people who are broadly sympathetic with them. Is it your view that the disproportionate attention that has been given uh, to the far right has benefited the far right? I mean, I, yes, to a certain extent. If no one talks about you, you don't exist. I mean, most we, we know most of, of reality through the media. So so media is attention is important. And even negative attention, particularly to breakthrough, is is positive. Now, as we have seen in various cases, like the FBO Ibiza scandal, for example, um, at a certain point in time, negative attention is no longer positive. Right? But but the disproportionate attention has helped them, but it has helped them kind of get into parliament. After that, I think the co-optation of their issues, as well as the narrowing of the political agenda to their issues and frames by both media and politics has played a major role. Yeah, but the crux that I see is that, you know, given the history um um, Europe, World War II, right? Uh, the rise of fascism. How can Europeans be quiet <laughs> about well, the far right? So I think there, there's another issue there. It's another pet peeve. <clears throat> and that is, I think we learned the wrong lesson from the Second World War. Okay. And so we have this um, stereotypical views, received wisdom, that Weimar was defeated by the Nazis in elections. But it wasn't, because the Nazi party, at its top, won one-third of the vote. The only reason that Hitler came to power <clears throat> is exactly the same reason why the far right is coming to power today, because parts of the right-wing establishment made coalitions with them. But even more important, in none of the other electoral somewhat electoral democracies of that time, did the far right get any type of success? Even in Italy, it was a relatively small party. But if you think about Britain or the Netherlands or even Belgium, right, the far right never attracted majorities or even pluralities in most countries. And so this idea that we have is that if we don't like are on top of them or ban them from the beginning, they will take over just as in Weimar is wrong. First of all, Weimar was the exception. And even in Weimar, only a plurality of the people voted for the far right. Hello from Ukraine. Um, I'm Evgenia and um, I would like to ask you what, to your mind, what could be the argument for far right politicians to uh, persuade them support Ukraine and uh, do they really feel that danger that comes from Russia or they don't uh, understand uh, it uh, or they uh, make like uh, they play they did not understand it so what what do you think about it I uh, thank you for the question I think this is an important issue like yet again um, there is a, a very simplistic and stereotypical image of the far right's position on Ukraine slash Russia. Um, so the, the broad idea is that the far right is pro-Russia, is pro-Putin. But actually, even before the second invasion of Ukraine by Russia, this was not the case. 
Right? This wasn't homogenous, the case. The far right in Poland and the Baltic countries, for example, um, were always very anti-Russian. Um, there were a couple of truly pro-Putin parties and politicians. Matteo Salvini stands out, um, Thierry Baudet in the, in the Netherlands, some others. For most, this was geopolitics. They were not necessarily pro-Putin. They were mostly against the U.S., um, they didn't want a unipolar world. They wanted a multipolar world so that no one was strong, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Since that second invasion, there are virtually no openly pro-Putin far-right parties left. Forum for Democracy is one of them. In fact, the strongest support for Russia comes from the far left. Um, some communist parties and also in the European Parliament. You have a, a small, you have a sizable minority, which is very much pro-Ukraine and anti-Russia. These are the parties mostly in the ECR that we talked about earlier. Law and Justice uh, and Meloni has chosen that path. A couple others. And then there are parties that kind of don't care. Um, that on the one hand, don't want Ukraine in the EU. On the other hand, don't want a dominant US and therefore kind of want Russia to play a role, but don't find this important enough to lose political favor over. And so at the moment, it, Putin is toxic. Like Putin is electorally toxic, which means that most far-right parties stay out of it. So what does that mean when the far-right becomes stronger? in the European Parliament. It means that support of Ukraine remains, but weakens a bit. It, it is inevitably going to weak anyway, because there will be Ukraine fatigue. Um, but there won't be a pro-Russian bloc. Rather, what the far right mostly does is that they are okay with support for Ukraine, but they are generally against sanctions of Russia, arguing that this doesn't actually affect the leaders in Russia, but it does affect the poor people in their own country, which is not without empirical base. Um, so I don't expect a fundamental shift, but anything more ambitious will become much more difficult because overall the far right is against pretty much anything that is more Europe. Thank everybody for attending and participating in this live event. And thank you so much, Cass, for being with us today. Many thanks again, of course, to uh, our subscribers and shareholders who make this possible. Keeping you informed in full independence, translating our articles into five languages has a cost. We need your support, so don't hesitate to join us and subscribe to Vox Europe. Spread the word about our subscription campaign as well. Thanks a lot. So to mark uh, the launch of this subscription campaign a week ago, uh, the Vox Europe team has prepared a video presenting the issues we tackle and the way we work in complete independence, of course. Uh, we invite you to watch the video at the end of this live report. Uh, it will introduce you to the Vox Europe team, so you will have a chance to meet those who are not on screen uh, today. Uh, the links to the team video are transmitted in the uh, chat room. You can watch the video with subtitles in English, French, Italiano, Espanol, und Deutsch. Enjoy. Mm -hmm.